Okay, so today is October 9th, Friday, and this is ECE 641, model-based imaging, and um, a few issues that we already just discussed, but uh, I'll sort of discuss broadly with everybody in uh, TV land, is that, uh, so I'm going to modify the plan for the exam. So we'll push the exam back two weeks. I'll send out an email. And we'll make the exam, we're going to assume the exam is going to be synchronous uh, with maybe a two hour time, but it will cover new problems and we'll cover new problems. Uh, so I'll make up some new problems, but they'll be based closely on the homework problems of the, for which I will send out some solutions. I need this to do that. And um, it, it'll be synchronous, so we'll have to establish a time, probably early in the morning for people in Indiana, uh, that will work for most people. I'll email all the people taking the class, and if there's people for which the synchronous time is not workable, you know, if it's three in the morning, then I'll set up more than uh, one synchronous time. But I think, uh, we don't have any people in Hawaii or the Pacific. So that's a big chunk of time zone that we don't have to worry about. I, I mean, I think we don't have anybody from Hawaii or the South Pacific so, um, or Australia. So, uh, but we'll figure it out. I'll send emails out and we'll figure it out. So, okay, good. And now, um, today, I want to pick up on the, the material for the, uh, uh, the uh, hold on the um, surrogate functions. Let me see. What am I going to do here? I'll go through this pretty fast, I think, because I want to get onto the constraint optimization. So um, uh, the basic. First of all, how many people read the notes? Okay. I appreciate it. I know it's hard, but trying to read the notes. Um, this is this is the basic idea of surrogate functions. Okay, you're trying to do minimization. The function you want to minimize is really complicated and expensive to compute. So you have a point here. This is your current point, and then you want to update. You want to go to a new point. Ideally, you you'd want to go to the minimum of this function. But in any case, you'd like to make the function, you'd find a, find a point where the function is smaller because you're trying to minimize it, right? The problem is, you'd say, well, that's simple, especially if it's a 1D minimization like a line search. You just evaluate the function at a bunch of points and you pick the one that's smallest. Unfortunately, that's easier said than done because each time you have to evaluate the function, it's very computationally expensive. So you need some kind of way of doing this which is cheaper, okay? Now, one possibility is that you could approximate this function by a quadratic, like a Taylor series. So you'd take, you'd set, you'd take the Taylor series. The Taylor series would be equal to the function at the point of approximation. It would have the same derivative, okay? And then it would have the same second derivative, right? The problem with that, and, and then you do the update, that would exactly be Newton-Raphson. That's exactly the Newton-Raphson algorithm. It's just a different way of thinking about the Newton-Raphson algorithm. In the Newton-Raphson algorithm, you're solving a rooting problem. Here you're solving minimization. But rooting and minimization are duals of the same, the flip sides of the same coin. Because if you take the derivative of this and you, and you root it, you're solving for the optimum, okay? as long as it's a convex function. So if you do the Taylor series expansion, that's exactly the same thing as doing the Newton-Raphson algorithm. Okay, but the problem is that that doesn't always converge. Why? Because imagine that you have the following thing, okay? Um, okay, this is a convex function, right? And okay, let's say we'll do it like this. Imagine you have this, like that, okay? And a convex function. 
And then you fit a Tiller series expansion over here. So the Tiller series expansion is like this. All right? And then, oh, this is the minimum. And whoa, you just went up into space. OK? So the Taylor series approximation is not a good idea. It seems like a good idea. But it, well, it's a good idea, but it doesn't work. And the problem is, is that, that it could overshoot badly. The reason it can go overshoot is because the Taylor series expansion is not necessarily an upper bound to this function. But it does result in the newton raphson algorithm, which gives another interpretation as to the problem with newton raphson Now, the, the first derivative is fine because it's tangent there. The problem is the second derivative. The seventh derivative doesn't give you an upper bound. What you want is you want something that, like, like this. Now, that will give you a very small update, like this. And you might say, well, that's not good because the update's really small. Well, OK, the update's small, but at least you didn't oscillate. It's not going off in the space. So, so that's the concept of surrogate functions. The concept of a surrogate function is you find a simpler function, which is an upper bound and tangent at the point of approximation. If that happens, OK, then the new value, x double prime, has to, this is x double prime, and this is f of x prime. The new value, f of x double prime, must be less than or equal to f of x prime. It's easy to show it. It's just a series of simple inequalities because this thing has to be less than that by assumption and this thing has to be less than that because you were doing a minimization and these two things have to be equal because you've assumed they're equal so the the key assumption for this is that uh, okay this thing here this is f of x right and this thing is q of x, except for q of x will be a different function for each point of approximation. So I also put a semicolon here and make it a function of x prime. Okay. So the x prime only changes with its e each iteration, but x you have to minimize with respect to. Okay. So the idea here is that x double prime equals the arg min over x of q of x, x prime, like that, OK? And um, that's the whole deal. Now, the equations for this thing are that, are two, or there's, there's two equations. The first equation is that the, the, the q function has to equal the f function at the point x, pr uh, x prime. So that means, uh, f of x prime equals q of x prime x prime. So that equation may look unintuitive or just kind of weird. But once you understand what it's saying, you go, oh, OK, well, it's pretty simple, right? The second thing is that for all x, uh, f of x is got to be less than or equal to q of x, x prime. So this says q is an upper bound on f. And this says that they're equal at the point of approximation. I don't have anything about it being tangent, because if those two things hold and it's continuously differentiable, it's got to be tangent. Why? Because if it wasn't tangent, if I zoomed in, so this is x prime. If it wasn't tangent, then it would mean the derivatives were not equal at that point, right? But if the derivatives are not equal, and the thing is a continuous function, there's got to be some epsilon ball under which, uh, within which it under, it, it's no longer an upper bound. So I can prove by contradiction it has to be tangent. 
Okay. So it's got to be tangent. So it, uh, I'll put here, you're reading the notes, right? Must be tangent. Okay. Assuming the derivative exists. So, uh, so, so there are different properties. I'll call it P1 is that if x double prime is the arg min over x of q of x x prime, then, then f of x double prime is less than or equal to q f of x. OK? That's really easy to show, all right, because you just use this picture. Okay. Uh, actually, I'll, this doesn't correspond to the notes, so I'm just using my own notation here, P1, P2, whatever. Sometimes you can't do that because it's actually too hard to do the minimization. So instead, you just do this. You say you find an x prime such that q of x prime given x is less than q of uh, x prime. In other words, you just find a value which makes it less. It's not necessarily minimum. If that's true, then it's still the case that f of x double prime has got to be less than f of x prime, okay? Or if I put less than or equal, then this becomes equal. Less than or equal, okay? Uh, three is that the gradient of f of x at x equals x prime is going to equal to the gradient with respect to x of q of x, x prime at x equals x prime. There's a lot of letters in that equation, but what it means is pretty simple. Uh, this is the tangent of the original function at the point of approximation, OK? And this is the tangent to the surrogate function at the point of approximation. All right? All right? Does that make sense? So that's true. And what else do I want to say? Oh, um, uh, you can say some things about convergence. So they get a little complicated. But if, um, if x star is equal to the arg min over x of q of x given x star. So in other words, if x star is, OK, uh, no, it, it, that's not what I wanted to write. Hold on. That's what I'd like to be true, but not what is true. OK, if that's true, right? So if this is, if this is the global minimum, so x star is the global minimum of f, then, then um, x star equals the arg min over x of q of x, x star. So what that means is that if you are at the global minimum, then it will be what's called a fixed point of the algorithm. Fixed point of algorithm. OK? In other words, uh, so what you'd like to know is if it's, it's a fixed point of the algorithm that it's a global minimum. That's, there are issues with that. I mean, that's not necessarily true uh, unless you make additional assumptions. Uh, and the reason is, is you can come up with counterexamples. Um, uh, so let's say that this is the function you're minimizing, right? And and that's your surrogate function, okay? So that's a legitimate surrogate function. 
by and and uh, 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 doing the applying the algorithm won't violate any of the things I said. It'll it'll result in a new value that for which is less which is this func value is cost function is less than or equal to the previous. But it 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 it's a fix, but it doesn't converge to the global minimum. And you can see why, because you're stuck, okay? But, you know, you wouldn't do that. Because <laughs> that's an obviously bad idea, okay? Right? It's an obviously bad idea. Uh, that's where the common sense thing comes in. If the thing is a continuously, if the thing is a continuously um, differentiable up or down, and if, uh, um, then, then uh, the uh, you know, it'll be an if and only of condition. Hmm? The example you mentioned before was it really tangent to the function at the? Well, it's not tangent because it's not differentiable. So this uh, this result of it being tangent is only true if the gradients exist. So implicit in this is the assumption that the gradients exist. But the conditions do not require that, that the gradient, that they be differentiable. OK, so I'm giving perverse counterexamples. Uh, they're not so terribly perverse, because we're going to deal. We, one of the things we talk about that's actually uh, been around for a while, but it's really uh, you know, people like, and maybe I'm not the biggest fan, but people do use it. Total variation. Uh, it's not continuously differentiable. So not functions which are not continuously differentiable do show up. And actually, the whole, the whole, the, there's a, th how many people have heard of compressed sensing? Uh, put up your hand proudly if you have, because two? But that means that five have not, one, two, three, six have not, okay? It's interesting because compressed sensing, in academia, there's a, uh, I've been in academia, I don't really consider myself an academic, okay? <laughs> All right, take that as you may. Uh, it's, I think what it is is it's just denial at this point because it's the only thing I've been doing for a long time. But, but I still like to talk about academics as being other people. Um, uh, in academia, you get these like waves, you know, like someone will come up like quantum computing and then people will go completely nuts over it and then they'll, and then they'll, they'll look back and they'll like, oh, well, let's pretend that didn't actually happen because it was a little embarrassing. And, um, <laughs> you know, so they kind of deny what happened, you know. Uh, a little bit, and uh, well, compressed sensing was a little bit. It was like one of these huge waves, okay, um, and it was like everything, okay. But uh, compressed sensing, as a, uh, in academia, um, the people, the people who do the best, it's usually best to be the last person to invent something. So if you think, you have to think about that a little bit. So. The compressed sensing people were sort of the last people to invent L1, the regularized inversion. So they got credit for it. But it was around for a lot longer. And, um, but they really kind of increased its um, traction in the community. And uh, so those sorts of cases do show up quite a bit in applications, particularly when you're trying to uh, reconstruct something that may not be a natural image. So that you know, like let's say you're trying to reconstruct a 3D, an integrated circuit. So you know it's formed by like discrete materials, especially if you ignore some of the details about diffusion across boundaries. So you know you have like different materials. You have silicon, you have metal layer. Uh, so uh, N NDE uh, applications, um, NDE stands for non-destructive evaluation. So you have like man-made objects that you're scanning. And often they'll form, be formed by discrete materials in which you have a discrete transition. So this kind of model can be effective in those application spaces. Um, but yeah, uh, but the continuous differentiability doesn't necessarily always hold. 
So I'm giving you kind of the broad outlines. If you wanted to be super specific about uh, theoretical results and convergence, it got com complicated. I, even in the notes, I don't go into a lot of detail uh, because I'm really just trying to hit the highlights to give you the flavor, okay? All right, good. But then most of the time, uh, the surrogate functions you're using to upper bound things are usually uh, continuously differentiable. And the t most typical case is they're quadratic. Even if they're quad, now even then, there raises a, you know, I just have to be truthful. The, uh, I feel like I should be full, you know, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, okay? So if you run this algorithm iteratively, the question is, you will get a sequence of decreasing Fs, okay? So the, the values of those Fs have to converge because they're monotonically decreasing and bounded below. There's a separate question as to whether the values of the Xs converge and whether they get, converge to a local or global minimum of the cost function. The convergence of the axis is much more subtle and difficult than the convergence of the function itself, okay? And the reason is, is that you can have all kinds of weird, bad stuff happen. Let's say that you have like a bowl coming out of the board. That you can, let's say, and you spiral like this. But you're bounded away from the center, so you put a boundary here. So you spiral in. You get infinitely closer to this thing, but you never go inside of it. And the global minimum's here. So then you have a, a monotonically decreasing sequence of, of values of the function, which converged, but they didn't converge to the, the global minimum. So there's a lot of weird things that you can do that are bad, okay? Uh, in the sense of not converging. Another, another way maybe of looking at it is you can have a function like this, right? This is the minimum, right? But let's say I come here and then I start there, right? And then I go here and I go here and I go here and I go here. So I'll have a monotonically decreasing sequence of values, but I won't convert to the global minimum. Uh, the problem there is intuitively, and it's important to understand intuitively what's the problem, so you don't create an algorithm that does something like this, okay? I mean, the problem is the conditions, the theoretical conditions that guarantee convergence to global minimum, there are theorems about these things. They tend to be very complicated, okay? So verifying that all your things meet all these conditions gets complicated. There's sort of a simpler practical view, in my opinion, which is just avoid doing really stupid things, okay? <laughs> like, the stupid thing here is that you're getting a sequence of, of updates where the size of the update is small, becomes small relative to the, to the fraction of distance left to travel. Right? So if you have an asymptotic sequence of steps you take, and yeah, okay, fine, they're all bounded above zero, but, but they're decreasing asymptotically so that you're taking really small steps when you still have a long way to go. So the ratio of the distance you have to go to, um, to how far you, you've gone goes to zero. That's a, that's a bad idea, right? It's like you say, you're driving home to grandmom's house, okay? And you're like, you know, well first, you know, you drove half the way and you went to the rest stop. And then you, then you go, okay, but then you start like going, stopping every five minutes. And you're stopping every 30 seconds. You're not making any progress anymore, okay? Because you're still 100 miles away. You go, well, we're only 100 miles away. Yeah, but I'm stopping every 30 seconds, okay? So I'm not going to converge. On the other hand, let's say you have an algorithm which each step only reduces the remaining, a call, the remaining distance by 1%. So it's a really bad algorithm because it only updates, it only makes a very small improvement, okay? But it's a fraction of the total distance. That algorithm will converge asymptotically. It's slow, but it will converge. So you want to avoid algorithms where there's some kind of fundamental quantization unit that sort of stops you from making progress. 
if that makes sense. It's not so dissimilar from what I was telling you earlier about quantization effects in algorithms can be really deadly in terms of their convergence because it just stops them, okay? Okay, so now uh, there's, oh, we're almost out of time. But the last thing I think I can go through super fast, okay? And then you're gonna read the notes, okay? Um, which is this. So uh, when we're doing these potential functions, remember the potential functions? Okay, rho of delta. We're gonna use this for updating the potential functions. So the potential functions look like this. They're not completely, uh, these, all our potential functions, all the convex potential functions had the property that the potential function was convex, and its derivative looked like this. It's a monotone increasing. So this thing, uh, this is monotone increasing, and okay, yeah. And then, so here's the thing. Um, it's not just monotone increasing. If I only look at the right-hand side of this thing, its second derivative is negative, right? So this thing is concave, and that thing is convex. The combination of the two functions is neither convex nor concave. But if you have a function like this, where the, the right-hand side of the derivative is convex, okay? I'm sorry, concave, this is concave, then it always has this property and uh, that, and I won't prove it, but I think it's either proved in the notes or it's, or I just kind of do a hand-waving thing, okay, because it gets a little complicated. If I take a point there, x prime, right, and then, then I'd have, oh, I'll call it delta prime, and this is minus delta prime. If I put a quadratic function in here, it's always going to be a surrogate function, which is to say it will always upper bound it. So for all the potential functions we've considered that are convex, uh, a quadratic function will always upper bound it, okay, in this case. Now, the interesting thing is this. I can take this point here. I, I, can, take, I can write any function of the form. Uh, I, can I can take this function here. It's, that's A. So we have Q of, of, um, of delta is equal to A plus I take the slope, whatever the slope is, I can calculate the slope. Um, so it's going to, I'll call that uh, uh, B over uh, B times, um, uh, this is delta minus delta prime, okay, that's the slope at this point, plus C over 2 times delta minus delta prime squared. That's the Taylor series expansion for the quadratic function I'm using as a surrogate function. So the C, the, all, these, all these functions will be, uh, are, this is like a family of surrogate functions, okay? But if I make C larger, then this thing will go up faster. They're all tangent and they're all equal, so they're all zero functions. But I can make C larger, okay? If I make C, now the disadvantage of making C larger is that what ends up happening is the steps get smaller. Are there any people outside in the hall? Because if there aren't, I'll go over a little bit. Okay. If, so here's the disadvantage. If I make C larger, what ends up happening is that my step size gets smaller. So the algorithm is more cautious, okay? If I make C smaller, then what ends up happening is that the step size gets larger, the algorithm is more aggressive, okay? If I get too aggressive, what ends up happening is that this thing will actually no longer be a surrogate function because it'll, it'll no longer upper bound. So the whole idea is to be as aggressive, it's like winning the Indy 500. In order to win the Indy 500, you have to be as aggressive as possible, but not break the rules, okay? Every, by construction, any team that wins at the Indy 500 came with a hair, within a hair's breadth of violating the rules. Why? Because if they didn't, they weren't doing the best they could. 
right? They figure out what the rules are, they read the rule book very carefully, and they come right up to the edge of what they're allowed to do. <laughs> And then the people come with the ruler and they go like this and they go, mm, and they're like, should we let them go? Yeah, I guess they just barely hit, got by, okay? So that's the game you play. The game is you play, you have to follow the rules, but you get as close as you can to violating them as possible, okay? So as you lower C, okay, this thing expands, right? When is the rule violated? The rule's violated just as you're touching that point. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because if you go any further, it'll actually go under and then you're violating the rule. So the point is, is that the most aggressive update you can have is when you have a quadratic function which touches here and which is touches here, okay? And when that happens, it will be tangent there. <laughs> So you don't have to worry about that, that. So you can, so the equation for deriving that, I call that the symmetric bound, okay? I made it up. I don't know if it's a standard thing, but it's what I call it, okay? So if you, so, so you can, you know that, so what do you, you know that this, this quadratic function is symmetric, okay? How do you figure, okay, so if you, turn, if you, if you calculate the derivative, what will happen, you calculate the derivative of this function, of the upper bounding function. The upper bounding function's derivative is a straight line, right? And the other function is like this. So they intersect here, corresponding to here. So this is the derivative of the, of the function you're, bound, uh, you're bounding. So what that equation comes up to is that it says that rho prime of delta prime, the derivative of delta prime, okay, equals, uh, yeah, uh, the second derivative, oh God, I got this messed up. Okay, okay, that, okay, I know. You so that's this point, zeros, right? So the second derivative, Okay, I'm going to explain this. C has got to be equal to rho prime over delta prime. Why? Where did that equation come from? I'll tell you. It's not obvious, maybe. That, this value here is rho prime of delta prime. That's zero, obviously. And this thing here is delta prime. So the slope slope is equal to rho prime of delta prime over delta prime, right? And the slope is the second derivative, which is exactly c. So c has got to be equal to this. Now, b, I don't even uh, care about. Why do I not care about b? Oh, b at zero is zero, so b is zero. Oh, here, oh. Let me rewrite this equation. I know it's a little confusing. Q delta is equal to a plus b times delta, b zero because it's a symmetric function, plus c over two times delta squared. So I have a formula for c b equals zero, and a I don't care about. Why don't I care about a? Because I'm doing minimization, any offset by constant I don't care about. So this is everything. So that allows me to find surrogate functions that are aggressive for this class of potential functions. Read the notes, okay? I know it was a little bit sloppy. Hopefully I'm giving you the inspiration. Okay? This is the key equation. And, that, and then that becomes the surrogate function. So what's the surrogate function? Let me just write it down. The surrogate function is, is what? I'll write it down and then and I'll let you go. Q of, yeah, I'll call it Q of, um, of delta uh, given delta prime is equal to one half delta squared times 
rho prime of delta prime over delta prime. That's the formula. The primed deltas are different than the non-primed. Because the non-primed deltas are the things you're actually minimizing over. The primed ones are the initial values. Now there's another step involved. So the first thing you have to do is that you just go, you take a deep breath, you go, you go back, now what's happened is you follow this, you think you understand it, but you're confused. So you go back and reread it three or four more times. Once this all is in your head, okay, and you're like, okay, I'm clear on that, then you have to take this and figure out how to actually apply it to the problem of solving for the map estimate, <laughs> okay? Now things get a little more complicated because this, row, this Q function has to plug in for the row function, but the row function had arguments, right? So you have to work through all that, and that's what I'll show you. Okay, we're not quite done. I have to go over it in the next class. The, um, that's what these crazy tables are, because they're... That when you go to do it, it's all real simple, except for it's not quite so simple because there's some, there's some, um, you know, you have to have some bookkeeping, okay? The bookkeeping gets a little complicated, so the bookkeeping is done for you in advance in this table, okay? So the bookkeeping is what? Um, what happens is this. When you do the update, so the problem you had to solve was, was what? Okay, you had to solve a problem. <sighs> Your original problem was that you had to solve, um, uh, I wish I had it written down in a simple form here. Here it is. Well, it's not even that. Okay, here it is. That's the original problem you have to solve. You, to do an ICD update of a single coordinate, say, uh, well, not even just to do an ICD update. This is the multidimensional function. It would work for ICD, but it works for gradient descent or any other algorithm. Any, uh, so, you, uh, so, so you have to solve, the, you have to minimize this function by doing an update in some direction. The problem is this row is not quadratic, right? So now the idea is you're going to replace each of these rows with a surrogate function that upper bounds it. Okay, when you go through the mathematics, what it copes out to, and you can read this, is that you get this. Uh, oh, where is... Uh, Okay, you get this, okay? This is kind of the cute part. What happens is you replace the rows with squared quantities. But what ends up happening, instead of having the original Bs, you now have the B tilde. There's these modified versions of the Bs. So the interpretation is this. You had this not quadratic function. Remember the idea, the reason you had the not quadratic function is because it penalized edges less than, say, homogeneous regions. But there's this, this sort of flip of your brain you do, where you replace that with a quadratic. Now the quadratic, the problem with that is it penalizes the edges the same. Except for now what happens is the Bs become spatially varying. And the Bs become small where the edges are. The Bs become small where the edges are. I mean, it's kind of a beautiful thing. So this is kind of the ad hoc thing people in neural networks would do anyway, right? But this is the formal justification for it. And the way you calculate those Bs is like this, with this crazy formula over here, OK? Well, hold on. You have to, yeah, OK. The, it looks a little complicated, OK? It, it, the, this is the application to a specific case. Hold on. Where's the general case? OK, well, there's a, here's the formula. Here's the formula. So this is how you calculate the Bs for each of the assumed functions. Uh, so that's where this table comes in handy. 
because you don't have to do it yourself, you just look it up in the table. But this is the general form. The general form is you take each B and you multiply it by this term, which is exactly the term I had written over here, okay? And essentially what it does is it downweights the Bs that are on edges. But the beauty of this is it's just not a crazy ad hoc thing. It has the interpretation of being the computation of the surrogate function, so you're guaranteed to converge. And actually, for typical cases, you're guaranteed to converge to the global minimum for the convex function. Okay? So that's a nice thing. Okay? Read this and try to understand it as best you can. Okay? And then the next time I think what I'll do is I'll go on to the I'm going to go to the next thing, because I'm trying to make some tracks, constrained optimization. Constrained optimization is really cool, okay? And it's super fun. And um, so if you thought you had a lot of fun with um, surrogate functions and Markov random fields, you, can, you just can't wait. You're not, not going to believe how much fun you're going to have with op constrained optimization, okay? <laughs> okay. And uh, oh, great. And then uh, so this is the end. I'll see you on Monday. Thank you. Bye.